Again, our topic for tonight is informal and non-formal STEM learning opportunities. Now to expand on the meaning of informal, that can be like, for example, a person going to a science center, a museum, or even being outdoors on uh, your own, at your own pace, at your own leisure, uh, previewing what you want. Like for example, with the museum example, a museum has plenty of exhibits, but you have an interest in seeing a specific one. So you just focus on that one. That's why it's informal learning. Non-formal learning is like an after-school learning program or a learning camp where there is an existing curriculum, there is an existing program, but there's no assessment attached to that. There's no grading system that attaches to those learning opportunities. So there's less stress uh, than a formal classroom would have. So I just wanted to identify both non-formal and informal uh, types of STEM learning opportunities that we will be discussing today. Now, the reason we selected this topic is because students are in school um, for, let's say, any given day, seven hours in class. And those seven hours break down into reading and writing, math, social studies, science, electives, and then you need time for lunch and breaks. So the day is broken up and there's very little time left in that schedule for STEM learning. So we'd like to provide more learning opportunities for STEM outside of school, maybe within the community, within your family. While you're having your quality time, you can also have moments of learning. And so that's the reason we selected tonight's topic. Also, this time of year is a time of year that most people start thinking about what they might do for the summer. And perhaps some apply for summer programs and start getting involved in that. And so it's a good time for this discussion and this conversation. Moving on. I'm your host for tonight, and my name is Scott Cohen. My sign is here, be on the ear. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a PhD student, doctoral student in science education at Georgia State University. And I'll turn the floor over and have the panelists introduce themselves and state where they're from and what their employment is. We'll start with Jennifer. Hello, my name's Jennifer. This is my name sign. I'm a sea turtle biologist here at Loggerhead Marine Life Center. The abbreviation is LMC. I'm originally from New York and I'm now living in Florida full time. I work with various different researchers in terms of uh, biology for sea turtles and I'm also involved in the program here as well. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Now, Brandon Call. Hi, I'm Brandon Call. I'm a science teacher at the Florida School for the Blind. I teach high school level, which I really enjoy. I teach zoology and environmental science. Also, I run an outdoors club after school uh, for students who are motivated to explore and have an itch to get out in the wild. I take them with me. We do fun things like kayaking on campus. And I also host a show called Wild Saga with Call. In that show, I uh, go out in the wild, I capture animals and basically talk to the community about what's out there when you do explore. This is Scott. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for that. And now we'll turn it over to Brittany. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Comegna, and I am living in Rochester, New York. I work at NTID, the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, and I run the national uh, non-credit program for students. Uh, there's a partnership with 35 different counties right now. We're offering 55 different course sections now related to STEM. So that keeps me plenty busy, but on the side, I have my own business called Deaf Green Thumbs. 
And my partner and I set up that business with the goal of sharing knowledge about houseplant care in ASL. We post many videos about that, and I've really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm excited and looking forward to our conversation and discussion. We also have CSD Learns, which is a team working behind the scenes, which has set up the webinar for today, setting up. I'd like to extend our gratitude to the CSD Learns. Thank you for that, CSD Learns. And at the same time, this webinar would not have happened without finance, financial support from General Motors. GM. General Motors has provided a grant to help sustain this program. So we'd like to also extend our gratitude to GM, General Motors. Thank you. Okay, thumbs up. Ready to dive into our content for tonight. We all ready? All right. Excited. Yeah. My first question for tonight is share your current involvement in either informal or non-formal STEM learning. And we'll go ahead and start with Brandon. This is Brandon responding. In terms of getting in depth, let me start with Wild Saga. Uh, I'm more self-taught in getting out in the wild and adventure. Uh, I was frustrated without having much to do, and too many resources, but I met a friend who liked fishing and I liked backpacking. And we thought, let's make some videos. And people really enjoyed them. And they said, guys, we wanna see more of this. And we went for it all the way. And we had a lot of fun. My friend and I realized that we were constantly learning. We weren't expecting to find things, they would just show up. And so we were learning on the go, which was a huge plus. And then we had that uh, interchange of knowledge with friends and I felt like I was helping the community uh, to continue and expand that. And so it can be challenging working on the videos for Wild Saga as well as my teaching career, but it's something I wanna continue. Now, in terms of the club, with the students uh, always asking questions and being very motivated. Uh, they want to have hands-on learning. Looking, they're looking for challenges to apply concepts to be able to make those connections. And so I am able to do that with the wild. We get out there, we can ask questions, we can find solutions, and that just leads to this momentum and more interest of STEM because the students have real life examples and realize what STEM is, they get more motivated and interested in it. This is Scott, thank you so much, Brandon. Now I'll turn it over to Brittany. Well, right now with Deaf Green Thumb, informal STEM learning is what we're providing through social media, through videos that we post regarding houseplant care. We post a video typically every week with new content. Usually on Tuesdays, we'll share a tip that's usually very simple, but a lot of things that people don't realize. And so we really use that approach. Uh, like one example is how to minimize or get rid of a gnat problem that you may have. There are certain types of sands you can use for the soil or insect killer or different watering uh, techniques that can resolve that problem. For an informal approach, what I've been doing is hosting workshops for people. I'll go visit different cities and different states and provide workshops in terms of plant care. Just three weeks ago, I went to Riverside, California, and I taught how to take care of cacti. I taught about cacti care, what their lighting needs are, um, if they should be placed near a south-facing window or north-facing window, uh, how to water cacti, also what type of soil you need to use and so on. I also um, use the convergent evolution theory and expand upon that. I really have a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Brittany. Jennifer? 
Great, thank you. Right now, as a sea, turty, sea turtle biologist, most of my work is on the beach. I go out and count nests and eggs, and I average about 10,000 a year, actually. But just recently, we got the record of 21,000 nests. Uh, the first year that I joined the LMC family, I had a lot of ideas to incorporate the deaf community in their work because I've been wanting to spread awareness about uh, sea turtle conservation. And so I was ready to roll up my sleeves. I was in the course of planning. And then LMC got a special request from a deaf participant for a interpreter. And they said, actually, we have a deaf employee who already works here. So it took 24 hours uh, for me to plan my first tour. And it worked so well that I've been working together with LMC to go ahead and establish an ASL-led program, including tours, e either in person or online. We have also added a new program. It's a nighttime sea turtle walk where people gather together and we can look uh, and find sea turtle nests on the beach and see what they look like. Another program, an ASL program that was added, takes place in the morning. It's a morning nest uh, exploration to see how many eggs have hatched and have not hatched in nests. It's a good experience for them to learn, of course, math because all of this is numbers related when you're counting nests and eggs. So this has been my second year as a part of this ASL program at LMC. Really nice. Keep expanding that program, Jennifer. Nice. Yeah. Now let me ask, can you share maybe a memory or a project, a favorite memory, favorite project, or maybe even something you're currently in with informal or non-formal learning. Um, just tell us about your favorite project or something cool that's come up. Uh, who'd like to start this time? This is Brandon. I'll start, Scott. Okay, Brandon. I have a Ken, uh, Wild Saga and my Outdoors Club. But with Wild Saga, my favorite part is getting up close with the animals and creatures that are out there. The best memory I have is probably being with alligators. I met a gentleman in South Florida that ran a alligator shelter. And the alligators were extremely used to people. So I thought, why not be the first to do sign language and share a video underwater with an alligator floating right above me while I sign and film it all underwater. And I thought, why not? That would be an amazing experience. When I told the gentleman about it, his job dropped. And he said, you want to sign underwater? I said, I sure can. I could sign anywhere. The more he thought about it, he said, why not? So that was a great memory. Now, with that outdoors club, every year I do a trip. Uh, I tend to take the students and we go kayaking to a remote island and we have a fire and when we're at that island there's a lot of times where there's purposes and dolphins jumping out of the water right next to us as we kayak which is an extremely fun thing to do and experience and when we're on the island of course all the students have all sorts of varied backgrounds uh, but I like to teach them how to make s'mores. Some of my students have never heard of s'mores they have no idea what they are. They look at the supplies and say, what is this? What kind of food is this? And I tell them, I don't know, it's American food. You got to try it. So they go ahead and try it. And then it's delicious and yummy. And I start to realize the type of impact that I have and the environment I'm exposing them to. And they're just wonderful experiences. This is Scott. Wow. Thank you, Brandon. Amazing. I would never imagined that someone's unfamiliar with a s'more. Right? I'm sure they gobble them up after they find out what they are. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you go next? Sure. You know, I have so many examples, but one that really was striking. This past summer, uh, I led a nest excavation, and there was one deaf child, a boy there with his mother, that had joined our group. And now this is southern Florida in the summertime. Note, it's hot and humid. And we're on the beach waiting to see how many eggs were counted in this one particular nest. And this nest was pretty deep. I would say it was probably about 30 inches. So it took a while to excavate and to finally find the eggs and uh, to pull them up. 
this deaf family was, you know, tolerating the heat through this whole time. And as they were counting the eggs, this one particular child was so fascinated and was asking a lot of questions. He asked why the egg hadn't hatched yet. And so there was actually a surprise that was found in the nest. There were three baby sea turtles that were stuck in the nest, which does happen quite often. Uh, most of the babies can make it out of the nest themselves, but occasionally you'll find a couple babies that are left behind, maybe because they're sick or they just can't get out themselves and they need that help. So we were able to rescue those three babies and this boy was so excited. Just thinking about him having this opportunity to see us release these sea turtles into the water. It was such a wonderful experience. And afterwards, the mother approached me and said that it was so inspiring for her to see a deaf person working in this field because sometimes it's hard to find to see deaf people working in ocean biology. So that really inspired me to continue this work. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's such a touching story. Having eggs hatch in your hands. That's not something you can see in the classroom. You have exactly. to built for that. Thank you right. for sharing that experience. Yeah. Brittany. Well, before I started Deaf Green Thumbs, I would often post things about my own plants and I enjoyed doing that. And through my postings, people would reach out to me and ask me questions about why they, their certain houseplants were struggling and I would identify the names of their plants for them so on. I decided to start distributing this information on a more broader scale because, you know, there's a lot of general knowledge that people don't have and in taking care of plants, it really boosts your self-esteem. It also, um, it gives back. It's a win-win situation. I feel good helping other people with their plants and they feel good once their plants are succeeding. And, you know, some people are afraid to step out because they're afraid, they're afraid to kill a plant, say, and I always encourage people just try, you know, oftentimes I've killed many plants and through those failures, I've learned from them. And, you know, I, I try to share the knowledge so that other people don't have to experience having their house plants die. But really, it was so inspiring in learning that something so special, so simple can really be special and bring people together. Thank you, Brittany. That is nice to gather and build a community and have that rapport of shared experiences. Really nice. Okay, so I'd like to remind our audience, if you have any questions, keep in mind, feel free to type those right into the Q&A box. When we see that there is a question populated, we will stop at a certain time and respond to those. So feel free to type away and ask any question you'd like res responded to. Moving on to our topic number two, next topic. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm asking you to think about back when you were young. Can you share maybe your favorite informal or, or non-formal learning experience uh, growing up that uh, impacted you and helped you uh, reach to, towards where you are today? And we'll start with Brittany. When I was a student at the California School for the Deaf, Fremont, every year they had a class called International Studies. And in this class, we uh, students would go to different countries and learn the language and customs of that particular country. So the year that I was a part of this class, we went to Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam and Southeast Asia. So I went to these three countries my senior year. And one of the things that we saw, we went to visit a fish farm, which uh, it was a small corral with a lot of different fish packed into one area. And you know, when you go to the grocery store, you'll sometimes see fish that are uh, for sale and they'll say wild caught or farm raised. And I never fully understood what that meant until I saw it in person in real life, I saw, okay, I finally understood what a fish farm was after seeing it. And that tied into, you know, learning about ethics of fishing, 
where there's no regulations and people can just fish until it decreases in uh, the population, which actually impacts the whole food chain because there's animals that depend on those fish. So there's great impacts based on that. So I learned a lot about controls on fishing, also water pollution issues that, you know, fish cannot be healthy if they're living in polluted waters, which impacts all of those animals upstream that, that feed on them. So that was something that was really good for me to see in person. And through that, I really learned a lot more than I probably would have learned in a classroom setting. I probably would not have understood in depth what that whole system was until I actually went there and saw it and it completely made sense to me. Thank you so much, Brittany, for your comment. So lucky to have the opportunity as a high school student to travel to another country. For sure. And definitely we know that any travel to a foreign country is a rich, rich experience. Thank you for that example. Jennifer. Well, growing up, I've always loved the ocean. I've all often gone to the beach. But in high school, I took an elective course in marine biology that was offered in my high school. And I knew I wanted to continue those studies. And my teacher told me about a special program that was being offered for high school students to study uh, one summer in Virginia to study ocean or marine biology. So of course I signed up for that. And that was the best time of my life in high school. It was a four week program and I was alone for the first time away from my family. So everything was a brand new experience for me. And during those four weeks, I learned so much about the ocean that I never knew before. For example, we went out on a boat and we pulled things out of the water to see them. We would go on adventures on the beach. We had our own independent projects that we were working on, other projects with other students. I really just saw and experienced so much. It was such a great experience experience for me. When I wanted to go back the next summer, I found out they closed that program because of lack of funding. So I always knew that I was going to do something in my life to help support this. You know, later on in life, I was going to do go and give back. So I did, I majored in marine biology for a short time. I shifted over to education and realized that wasn't really in my heart. I wanted to go out in the fields and I was not really much of a classroom learner so of course I went back into my love of marine biology and now look at where I'm at I have this amazing role at LMC looking back at that first experience that brought me here I realized I've I had this goal since that program in high school so I, I really see the need to give back to the deaf community when it comes to climate change, pollution, plagues that impact the sea turtle population and its decline. I really feel like I have a special and unique place to do the work and do the research to help grow the sea turtle population. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. And I agree, it's a challenge for the out of school learning uh, due to resources, financial resources. So very fortunate for you to take advantage of that program before it uh, shut down. And so yeah. I look forward to you establishing a new program for our deaf youth nowadays. It's in the works. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Brandon, we'll turn it over to you now. Uh, I want to talk about when I was young, with Boy Scouts in my home life. Uh, when I was young, I really wanted a dog, but it was a problem with my mom. She's not too wild about dogs. My mom told me I was allergic to dogs. I said, really? I was devastated. I didn't know what else I could have. I saw kids in the neighborhood playing with their dogs and wanted to be like them. So when I was five, my mom said I could have a pet. It just couldn't be a dog. So I landed on a gecko. And I took care of it. Then I got more. I got three. I got four, I had 10, I had 30, and then I had almost 100 different reptiles. I would take care of them, I would study their environment, and I would set one up and recreate it. I've had rattlesnakes, I've had so many types of reptiles. 
I really gotten in deep into the reptilian world. So much so that my mom covers up her eyes and thinks I should have gotten him a dog, but I ran with it and it was my life. I mean, I just got so in depth and learned so much and enriched myself through my own frustrations by having those pets and through my successes, right? Uh, so some of my pets lived longer and had babies and were born. And I of course realized what it was that I did to get that to happen and what it was I did to get that not to happen. And I was successful there. Now talking about the Boy Scouts and being outdoors, uh, this is Scott. What is that sign you're making? What does that stand for? Oh, this sign is the Boy Scouts. Thank you. This is Brandon again. I was the only deaf uh, troop there. The rest were hearing. And a lot of times I would just disappear. I'd be gone in a second. I'd be lost in the woods exploring. One time I was in Yosemite and uh, I confronted a bear. Uh, but I won't mention that story right now. That's for another time. Uh, but I had a lot of self-growth, self-enrichment, and I still have that really strong passion, but I'm looking more towards conservation because things are changing in the world nowadays. There's a lot going on, and I'm trying to teach the students. In the outdoors club, I try to give examples because Florida has a problem with invasive species. And uh, in my classroom, we go outdoors and we go out and we look for those species, invasive species. We try to identify them, we try to separate them. And so I keep trying to share and pass that passion along to the students I work with. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you for that. This is Scott speaking. I look forward to hearing about that bear story some other time, huh? And it looks like Brittany would like to say something. Brittany, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to add, as you were talking, Brandon, I remembered a story um, back when I was a kid, I would go out exploring and my bachelor's degree is in biology. My father's bachelor's degree is in biology. He is a science nerd and he would often bring home various different animals and talk about what they are. I remember one day he brought a snake and a toad. I had caught a snake and a toad. I was about four years old. It was your regular garden snake was black, you know, with the red uh, stripes on it, that regular type of snake. I brought it to my dad and he said, you know, this snake can eat this big toad. And I thought that was impossible. It was a small snake and a huge toad. And my dad said, yep, watch. And he put them together and the snake ate the toad. I could not believe it. It was so shocking. It stuck with me. And same situation. We'd go out for walks and my dad would show me various different animals. And that exposure really helped me treasure the environment. And this is Scott speaking. What a cool story. I'm sure you're probably heartbroken at four years of age to see an animal die. I actually thought it was really cool. <laughs> I learned something oh, new. Really nice. Okay, we have a question from our audience members so far. They want to ask what the difference is between informal and non-formal learning. So I explained it at the beginning and I may have forgotten. So who wants to take a stab at it? Catalyst, I guess I Jennifer? can. Okay. So informal learning is more like learning that's done out in the field instead of in the classroom. Classroom learning is more formal with the teacher, textbook, and so on. But informal learning is something that happens when you're just learning on your own, hands-on, getting that experience. That's my take on it. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Brandon, Brittany, is there anything you'd like to add? I think you explained it perfectly, Brittany, but I guess you can also include people going online and reading things on different websites and articles, checking out videos. Learning is done that way, too. And this is Scott. You know, actually, when we were young, we didn't have technology or the Internet. We weren't uh, able to have videos like that. And so with modern day technology, we have tons of resources and information available around us everywhere. So is there any advice on how we can evaluate online information? Panelists? Brittany, Brittany. saying, you know, for me personally, 
with deaf green thumbs, when people reach out to me, they'll ask me for clarification or for me to expand or explain something. I'll often research other sources and other people and do a comparison. You know, there's a lot of advice out there in terms of what to do for houseplants, but I'll find a commonality because sometimes people can, you know, there's wrong information out there. And if people follow the wrong advice, they'll suffer as a result of that because of that incorrect information source. So often I'll find a commonality and where my experience matches with what I've read, that's where I'll post. Also, I'll refer people to similar sources with more additional information. And uh, also it's good to find resources that have a large amount of uh, proof. It's always good to look and see where your sources are coming from and where their sources are coming from so that you can verify a certain source or not. Especially, you know, once someone is posting some information, it's good to find out where they're getting this information from. Sometimes you can verify it through Snopes or through, through other types of uh, sources that are out there to verify. Brittany, yeah, the comparison and and the contrasting is critical and it's important to make sure things align with uh, current knowledge out there but it's more work but you get better results right yes this is brandon i completely agree it's somewhat similar with my show i look at other stories from private companies i look to those who also have a passage passion for research not just a dot-com place with some sterile information. I look for people that have a passion and also vlog and try to compare and contrast off them. And I also realize that a lot of students are looking at their phone. And so I ask myself, what can I put into that phone to get their jaws to drop as they stare at it maybe? This is Scott. Brandon, thanks. That is so true. Almost everyone's eyes nowadays are focused on their phone, right? Which means that our, our periphery is collapsing into a cell phone space and so we've got to put our message into that tiny space and this is brandon right scott i also noticed that nowadays there's a lot of resources available on a cell phone or on a mobile phone but people are unsure as to how to use them and they just focus to social media and that's where we can jump in and help change things uh, for example i have a student who's born and raised in florida and we were outdoors and he was on his phone while we were outdoors and we told him you're missing out pay attention to where you're at and there was a rotate spoon tail which is a rare type of bird and we told him to look out and we said look up he looked up and he saw this magnificent purplish colored bird and he says oh wow have they been sitting here this whole time because they're a rare bird and I said, yes. And he said, well, how long have they been here? I said, for 10 years. He said, you're standing there staring at your phone. You didn't see it as you came up. So we really got him thinking more about the outdoors. Well, this is Scott responding. That's better late than never, right, Brandon? True. It sure is. This is Scott. Yeah, we all should balance our screen time along with our real lifetime. Jennifer, it looks like you want to add something? Yeah, I completely agree with what Brandon was just sharing. It also helps if students have support, not just from teachers, but from their parents and family members, even interpreters that in, the, in their schools. For example, uh, I had one friend who asked a teacher permission to reach out to me because they wanted to do a research paper on sea turtles, but uh, wanted to get some real facts and some real knowledge. So the student asked me and asked their teacher if they could reach out to me. So the student emailed me various questions that they had. So it was really nice to have that connection. The in, you never know who you know and what, where and these connections can lead. You know, just out of the blue, some person just in the middle of nowhere wanted to know about sea turtles but didn't know who they could speak with in their city. And my name was brought up and they reached out to me. It's nice if more and more people have that support from the community around them, not just within the school. This is Scott. That's true. It's nice to have that opportunity to connect, Jennifer. So true. And also, that's one of the reasons behind tonight's webinar, so we can share resources 
outside of school. Very, very good point there. Moving on now to our next topic. We've sort of touched upon it, but I'd like to ask directly, uh, what advice do you have for teachers of uh, deaf students on informal and non-formal STEM learning experiences uh, to help students prepare for the future? And what can teachers do to keep their skills and knowledge updated in the field nowadays? Brandon, go ahead. I'm a teacher, so I might as well respond. My advice is pull them out. Pull them outside, even if they're screaming and yelling. Pull them outside, take them outside. They'll thank you later. Show them everything outdoors that you can. And then try to connect the applications. Try to connect your lesson to what's happening outside so they can make sense of the world and start to appreciate things more so that our students can start to recognize and become aware and identify things. For example, on an annual basis, uh, I tell my students I'm gonna have a week of fun. We have a, a classification uh, for different animals and a lot of times they look like giant words, boring words to students. And so we go outside. I take them outside and I tell them they need to identify 10 types of bugs. They cannot be the same. They need to be 10 separate different bugs. So if anyone catches anything that's similar or too many, they can negotiate with each other and start creating them. So of course the students get really motivated. They go out there and collect as many bugs as they can. They bring them in and then I have them identify them by their scientific name. And of course the one with the strangest name or odd, most oddball name wins a prize. So usually uh, I have a hall of fame page that I put these bugs on. I have about 200 bugs on my wall and they all have unique names. And of course, all the students want to get their bug on the wall because then they know they'll be remembered. And so they ask me who found that bug and how did, they, how did they get there? And so I found a fun way to motivate them to get them to connect these scientific names and all that jargon to the bugs and insects that are outside. That's one way. Now, again, another way in getting the students to understand how invasive species, what their impact is, what we do is we go outside, we collect small animals, and so I've had times when I've done that with the students, they bring in the animals. And there's a small green lizard called an anole that lives in Florida. What we do is we take it, put it into a box, and then the students go out and find a cumin tree frog. And they bring it in, and then we watch what happens. And then they log daily and slowly recognize that the anoles start disappearing and that the tree frogs keep becoming bigger and bigger. And so I asked the students, what do you think is happening? Why? And they say, maybe they're not used to the new type of predator and he's just gobbling them up. And so the students realize it and they make that connection and, and it sticks. When you allow the students to make connections naturally, it sticks. That's my advice. This is Scott. Brandon, that's some really nice advice. You said you want to have some outdoor experiences inside the school and connect things so that students can learn more and have much more meaningful learning opportunities. We often have computer models ready to show at the touch of a button, and, uh, but the concept you're talking about is abstract. So when you make it concrete, when you can take a science concept and make it concrete, because most science concepts are abstract, it's really nice, well done, well done. Jennifer, go ahead. Yeah, you know, looking back at my high school days, I had a few really amazing teachers. For example, my marine biology teacher knew that I was really interested in the ocean. I was always asking questions. We also developed a good relationship because this teacher helped me dissect a squid. Yeah, my teacher gave me a squid to dissect and help me connect with a marine rescue organization. I volunteered in high school after hours to help this uh, place with seals and sea turtles and so forth. So this teacher really encouraged me to do some hands-on exploration and I encourage that as well. If your school doesn't have these types of programs or clubs, research something outdoors related. There's gotta be something near you related to animals or maybe you can connect with the zoo. Also, if you know a particular person, a deaf person in a STEM field, 
but let's say this person works as an engineer and that doesn't really tie in with what your students are interested in, go ahead and reach out to them anyway because they may have connections. They may know someone else that is in your field of interest. As we mentioned, you never know who you know until you reach out to them and who they know. So keep that network open. You never know who you could reach in the end. Jennifer, you make a valid point there. And I want to add to our resources, Atomic Hands. Uh, Atomic Hands has several, uh, several people, professionals who are in the STEM field at their website. However, we still need to add more. So if anyone here knows anyone, feel free to reach out to Atomic Hands and we'll continue to add to our database because the more we know, the more information we can share. Also, it's not really what you know. We all know it's who you know. Yep, exactly. Who you can make that connection to can really expand and enrich your learning. Brittany. I think Brandon and Jennifer said, gave some wonderful examples. So I just want to add to that, that if you are have an activity, uh, maybe it's after school or in a club where you're going out and learning about animals and maybe you have a student that's not comfortable with it. You can always assign that student with a different role still within the umbrella of STEM, you know, uh, researching and collecting animals. If they're not comfortable with that, maybe they can do the document, documenting of it. They can take pictures of the animal or uh, also you can have students. Um, engineer a, a habitat and you know put the right uh, environment together for those animals or creatures that are being uh, caught you can assign another role as a data or statistician so and you can also have the students switch roles so you cover everything stem as a whole uh, in different ways you can switch the roles and keep it fun by rotating it that way or you can assign roles uh, that are specific to their interests. Not everyone's interested in everything, and that's okay. It just encourage them where their interests are. Growing up, I always felt pressure to know information and to appear to be smart. I always had that pressure on me. And sometimes I would ask a question that would show that I didn't know the answer, I didn't have that knowledge, and sometimes I would shy away from asking these questions because I didn't want to be mocked or uh, didn't want to be looked down upon. I think it's so important to develop a culture of inquiry and encourage students to ask questions, even if they're kind of outlandish, because that's where their interest is and that will help foster their curiosity. And then that will lead to a merging of the topic that you're trying to teach. But really I feel like students don't ask a lot of questions so we need even now all the more where we're our students have standardized testing and um, you know more strict criteria is put on them there's not enough room for exploration and really for students to learn that it's okay to fail it's okay to be wrong that's how you learn and there's still fun to be had in that in that learning so encourage that it's okay Brittany, thank you. Uh, you actually brought up three, three points for me. Failure, in terms of failure, it's a word I saw at a conference. I saw productive struggle. <laughs> yeah, productive right? struggle. It's a productive yeah. struggle to make something. We all experience that in our lives and in our careers, uh, but it's not reflected in the classroom ever. Uh, so, so, so right, failing's okay because it's what you do next and how you overcome the issue that matters. And that leads me into the second point that came to mind was content learning, uh, out of school learning, uh, informal learning, right? It's, it's not the primary thing. The primary thing is for our students to explore. Like you mentioned, uh, most of you said you were interested through your exploration. That exploration led you to the content learning like what Brandon said, all those vocabulary words and names, put those to the side, go out there, do things in real life, bring it back to the classroom, and then make that connection. Uh, 
that's a fantastic way to encourage our students to get out there and do some of that content learning. My third point, and roles. Uh, and now in the 21st century, with learning skills, communication, working together, innovation, and critical thinking skills, uh, the four C's, uh, assigning the roles, like was mentioned, and then the coordination amongst each other, and then the creativity with each other to work together, and knowing that they're all a one, and they all together as a group can build more knowledge than they can individually. And so that isn't critical to have that connection out of school uh, in real life and also in school. Uh, I'm just curious to ask the group at this point, are you all involved in any professional organizations uh, with any non-formal informal learning? Like for example, Brittany, you mentioned your plants, uh, advice that you give, and then Brandon Call, you mentioned uh, your uh, wild saga, wild saga. Are there in those professional opportunities any opportunities to provide education or an enhancement of skills? Jennifer, please. Yes, LMC has a wonderful education department that provides a long list of resources involving homeschool, uh, field trips, just so much out there. Yeah, there's a lot of resources available. This is Scott, okay. Jennifer, is that information online as well? I'll have to check, but I'm pretty sure that we do offer information on our website if you go to our LMC website. Thank you so much, Jennifer, that is nice. Brandon, I see you have a comment. Right, Scott. I had a professional organization find me while I was doing my outdoor club thing. Uh, there is a local research uh, organization nearby uh, for the estuary and the water res local water resources. So I took our class over to the estuary. We seem to always go there. And one day there was a gal who approached us and she said, hey, I want to work with you. And I looked around. I didn't know who she was. And she was uh, a, a, a researcher that wanted to involve deaf people to understand how they can make accommodations for the deaf and blind. And so we might have some students that wanna research the estuary there. And so they were looking for ASL resources. So what I did is I put some of those into sign language. So instead of having all the instruction in English, it's also in sign language. So any of the local schools that would like to visit the area before they commence any activities, they can look at the estuary's information in American Sign Language and then move forward with those activities. We have like a plotting uh, uh, activity where they can count how many plants are within that plot. And then we also have another activity where they can identify fish, which are netted, and then they can look at the different type of species. And there's all sorts of different activities that are added there at the program. And again, it's a conservancy, a river conservancy program. And I believe, uh, they're in about 19 uh, states throughout the country. So these videos can be moved along to these other locations and they just have to be adjusted to be ready for that area. And that information will be shared throughout the states. This is Scott, that's really nice, Brandon. You've done something for our future students uh, to have access while they're outdoors. Extremely nice, very nice. Brittany, do you wanna to add to that? Yes, um, not involved with any professional organization, but what we do is connect with people who breed plants themselves. You can actually breed plants, that it is a thing. For example, here in Rochester, there's one person who uh, has a plot of lilies at their home that they grow, and they breed various different colors of lilies. This person's been doing it as a hobby for 20 years, and they will actually crossbreed flowers, different colors, and make a whole new color and their home has just rows and rows and rows of lilies. And so I learned about that process. Um, it's more of a community approach. Just people that have you know, picked up certain hobbies in terms of plant, growing plants that I've learned from and then shared. You know, on a daily basis, the average person will 
connect with things that are relatable or shared experiences that are just in their own natural home and, and habitat. And so that's a way that I connect and share information with people. Having the connection to the experts, right, Brittany? Right, they're in your community. They are. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're in their own professional organizations. Yes, and also African violets. There's one person who lives here. No, I'm sorry. Bonsai, bonsai. Uh, there is a professional organization, a, a group of people who study and are very knowledgeable in bonsai. And one of the top, top, top uh, producers or caretakers of bonsai actually live here in Rochester and um, is very uh, knowledgeable about aquatics as well. So I reach out to this knowledgeable person often. It is good to find local connections. And you know, it's so fun to learn different people's stories and their journey uh, with specific species of plants. Nice, very nice, Brittany. So we all have opportunities to continue learning in your fields and your careers. This is really good. It just shows we never stop learning. Exactly. Roll up our sleeves and keep learning. Really cool. Okay, we are nearing the close of our webinar. We'd like to share some of our resources. And you can see the slide is now showing a listing of various summer camps for deaf and hard of hearing students that will be taking place this summer. We've got the dates listed there. Uh, some of them are focused on computer security, cybersecurity. Some are drone focused. And there's also others that are marine focused. And then they are generally STEM oriented outdoor programs. We will have that posted at CSD Learn's website. Feel free to reach out to me and I can share this information and send you referrals as needed. Summer programs set aside, there are also year-round programs that also involve competitions. There's STEM competitions, there's academic bowl competitions, and these are competitions, again, that run year-round. So you do have a chance to be a part of them and meet other students that share similar interests and engage and make connections with those folks as well. Next month, there will be a middle school robotics competition at the Texas School for the Deaf. And there's also a high school robotics competition at the Alabama School for the Deaf. I believe they started last year with an all deaf team. Again, all deaf team. Uh, yes. In North Carolina there. And so now they're adding a middle school team this year. So there are opportunities out there to be a part of that informal, non-formal learning. And also, uh, there are workshops offered by RIT. Uh, they provide workshops, as you can see in the slide there. And I encourage anyone out there to become a part of professional organizations because they have multiple, multiple amounts of resources that you don't need to create for yourselves. And we can get those, uh, that information and those resources and put it into sign language for our deaf students. Now, here is a list of more resources specifically focused in American Sign Language, having to do with science as a subject. Some are science concepts, some are just signs in science, others are experiences with science experiences, uh, with science experiments. And so teachers, feel free to go ahead and access this information and share with your students as well to encourage your STEM learning. Now we've got teaching resources and teaching curriculum that you can pull from and use. What's really nice about online resources is that they are updated. Keep in mind with in-print versions of resources, after the years gone by, that's outdated material. And a lot of schools have 10, 20 year old material. And so that's one of the neat benefits with having digital resources is that they're instantly updated when necessary. And here we go, some of our panelist programs. We have some of their information here. So if you would like to follow, them and show your students what these cool deaf role models are doing in the STEM field, please feel free to do that and they can see their post. Now I do know that Brittany and Brandon have their own pages specifically 
for their jobs and careers. And Jennifer will be creating one soon, right? Yes, very soon. It's exciting. We're all looking forward to it, Jennifer. Yes. And you can reach out to Brittany and Brandon and ask any more questions you may have through social media. Yes, you're welcome to reach out. Well, we're just about done again with our third webinar in the series. Thank you all so much, panelists. Thank you for being here. And we're looking forward to three more webinars after this with three different groups of panelists. And I'm sure some of those panelists are watching tonight to get an idea of what their session will be like. Next month, we will have a women's group, Women in the STEM field, uh, with their unique experiences, because the STEM field is heavily populated with men. And we'd like to encourage more women in the field. So we'd like to hear their experiences. After that, we will have people of color sharing their experience. Again, the STEM field is populated heavily with what happens to be a white male gender. So we want to talk to some POCs and get their insights on that. And then we also have a series with college students who are learning about the STEM field and will take their experiences and how, how we can take their experiences to help enhance our students learning who are headed in the same direction they are. And let me see if there's any questions there. Yes, this will be posted. Our webinar will be posted at CSD Learn's website. The last, well, no, let me restart. The first webinar is already posted. The second one has not yet been posted. It's getting the captions added. It's being edited so it can be a clean copy. So this webinar should be ready within about a month before it's posted on their page. So you will have an opportunity to use this webinar with your students. Uh, at your schools, with your professional development team, uh, with whoever needs this amazing resource is who you'll be able to share that with. And we will also be doing a survey so that we may always enhance our content for you, our audience. Well, thanks again for joining us tonight. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email is posted on the slide. Thumbs up, everyone. We've made it to seven. Good night. Thank you, everyone. And we'll spend some time here with us. All right. Good.